Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Keratoconus Foundation Evening Webinar Series. My name is Gloria Chu, and I am happy to be your moderator for this evening. I practice at the USC Roski Eye Institute, Department of Ophthalmology in Los Angeles, and I'm very pleased to introduce our special speaker tonight. We have Dr. Greg Puzateri, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of his background before he starts his talk today. Dr. Puzateri is the founder of the E-Center for Hope and Vision Corporation and serves as its executive director. He is also currently the owner and president of the New Horizons Low Vision Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado. His practice specializes in low vision rehabilitation with an emphasis on counseling and technology. He completed his doctorate of optometry at the Illinois College of Optometry, where he served as both a clinical instructor and adjunct faculty. Dr. Puzatari received his Master of Divinity degree from the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary and went on to lead the Alto Reformed Church in Waipun, as its senior pastor for 10 years. He's going to have to pronounce that city for me. <laughs> Working for the Spectrios Institute for Low Vision in Wheaton, Illinois, he supervised the residents in low vision rehabilitation and managed the fourth year externship program. He, he was also the research coordinator and acted as the liaison between Spectrios Institute for Low Vision and other healthcare organizations. He's a regular seminar and continuing education presenter, a motivational speaker, and provides counseling and technology training to people in need. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce first our topic for this evening, which is coping with vision loss and keratoconus, and our speaker, Dr. Greg Pusateri. And just a few housekeeping items after his talk, we will be taking time for questions. And so you're welcome to type in any questions that you may have so we can be sure to address them. And also wanted to highlight that tomorrow, November 10th, is National Keratoconus, uh, World Keratoconus Day. So we're very happy to have everyone here to, to celebrate this very special occasion to recognize keratoconus and all of the challenges that our patients undergo and all we're doing to learn more about this condition, bring mm -hmm. awareness to keratoconus so that we can better treat our patients. So Dr. Puzateri, I am going to turn it over to you now. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chu. Um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'll put this slide up. Um, and, you know, uh, so, it's, yeah, so the, the two names, uh, it's, it's University of Dubuque Theological Seminary, so at Dubuque, Iowa, and it was Wapan is actually how they pronounced that. Wapan, Wisconsin was where the church was, so. Got um, it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. They're, they're, neither one are spelled in ways in which it's, like, uh, evident which way is the right way, so. Um, yeah, so I appreciate the invitation to be able to speak, uh, especially on the on the eve of World Keratoconus Day. Um, uh, really honored uh, that I was asked to talk about this. Coping with vision loss is something that uh, is is near and dear to my heart. Uh, hopefully, you will understand that as we go through um, our presentation tonight. And uh, and I really do invite people to please ask questions. Feel free to do that because. Uh, that's what this is about, each of us learning and, and helping each other so that we can help uh, those with keratoconus and, and those with vision loss in general uh, to regain their independence. Uh, that's, that's what I'm all about, helping people find hope and independence. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and talk. We'll talk a little bit about my background, my story. Uh, as far as vision loss goes, in my family, there are not any individuals who actually have keratoconus per se, but I did grow up uh, watching my grandmother uh, who came over from Italy 
uh, my aunt, my uncle, and my father, all from siblings from the same family, all struggle with a inherited retinal degeneration. Uh, and as a kid, I watched them use whatever they could to try and be able to see, to do the things they wanted to do. Uh, in fact, my grandmother, um, you know, cooked on a gas stove and she was, though she was severely visually impaired, she was an unbelievable cook. Um, and so I would go to their house and I would uh, sit in the kitchen. I would talk with her while she was cooking and, and I would watch her and she would turn on the gas stove and the way that she found out if she had it set properly uh, to the right height was she would literally wave her finger through the flame. And I was like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? And, and she would, you know, as grandmothers will do, she would just turn around and say, now you just shut up and be quiet and let me do what I'm doing. Um, so I chuckle about that today, but you know, we all find ways to work around, but you know, um, this diagnosis of what's in the family was called cone, it was originally misdiagnosed as retinitis pigmentosa. And it wasn't until in the uh, 80s that we actually had an opportunity to see Dr. Gerald Fishman in Chicago, who's a world authority on retinitis pigmentosa or RP. And he said, yeah, that's not what you have. You have cone rod dystrophy. Uh, so uh, we learned at that point, that's what it was. Uh, and you know, watching them and watching them struggle, they did not have what we are blessed with today. Uh, and, and it was my dream that there, I just said, there's got to be a better way for people who struggle in any way, shape or form with some form of, of degeneration uh, process that has affected their vision, whether it's from an injury or stroke or a dystrophy, keratoconus, whatever, you know, those things, there's got to be things that can help people to continue to do the things that they want to do. Uh, and I am, uh, fiercely after that each and every day. And that was my dream, was to be able to, to find a way there, uh, to, to help people who struggle with vision loss. That, that's been a passion of mine from the time I was a little boy after watching them struggle. Uh, so, you know, I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, for those of us here in this seminar, you know, we are talking about a per form of permanent vision loss. Uh, we don't have a cure uh, per se. Um, and, you know, people come in all the time and, and Dr. Chu can tell you this, uh, anybody else who works in the field of low vision uh, will tell you this, people, the number one question is, well, can't you just give me stronger glasses? Okay, I mean, there's gotta be, you know, stronger glasses that can help me. Uh, well, one of the things that I talk with patients about on a regular basis is, you know, we all gr have grown up in a society that's built on cure. When you get sick, you go to the doctor, you expect them to give you some pills, give you a shot, give you some cough syrup, some eye drops, uh, some pills, something to take that's gonna start making you better inside of you know three days or so. Uh, well, we don't have a, a lot of those things for the eye yet. And I emphasize yet heavily because there are many things that are changing. Um, and you know, maybe Dr. Chu can even address this later, but you know, corneal cross-linking and, and keratoconus, uh, a breakthrough in which it's helping people, scleral lenses to be able to help um, people to be able to see more clearly with, you know, uh, without the distortion that can come uh, with keratoconus. So, you know, we have all learned to depend on that, and yet there isn't anything for that. And when I talk with people about that, you know, oftentimes people who are struggling with vision loss from whatever diagnosis feel like once they've heard that, first of all, it's a difficult pill to swallow. You literally go through the grieving process. Okay. And the first one is like denial. It, it, this can't be, it's not possible. And then there's depression from the idea that this is permanent and I'm never going to be able to do these things again. And you feel like the walls are closing in. Um, and my goal is to try and help people understand that that doesn't need to be the way uh, that things are going to go for them. All right. You know, choices. Uh, and that's when you've heard that diagnosis, you've now 
begun to deal maybe with some of that depression? And then what direction are you going to go? You know, we all have choices in our life every single day. When we wake up from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, we are making choices. Get out of bed, stay in bed. You know, do I get uh, breakfast first or do I get cleaned up first? When I leave the house, do I turn right or do I turn left? Do I stand or do I sit? Do I do good? Do I do bad? Right or wrong? Every single thing that we do is a choice in our life. Um, and so what we have to do at that point is ask ourselves, what are the choices we're making in relation to the fact that we've been diagnosed with uh, keratoconus or another form of vision loss? Okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to lay down and allow ourselves to be defined by our vision loss and give up? Uh, which I will not let you do. I will not let any of my patients do that. Um, are you going to allow yourself or are you going to choose your, to allow yourself to be defined by that or to live as the victim? Okay. And that's just not going to be the way. That's not the path to success. That's not the path to happiness. It's not the path back to independence. A lot of people oftentimes believe that once this happens, you give up many, many things and you feel you'll never be able to do that again. And that's just not true. There are many, many things that yes, you know, when you have vision loss, you may have to uh, change how you do, uh, but it does not mean that you have to quit living, okay? Uh, so the idea of not living as a victim is, you know, what do we do? Then you need to focus not on what you've lost, you need to focus on what you still have. Okay, and that is a big difference. People come into my office, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Uh, I will give you an example. I had a gentleman come in uh, for an evaluation and I took my case history, got information, and then I stood up to have him read my acuity or eye chart. And I stood next to the chart and I said, so what number can you see here? The chart that I use uses a um, a very large number, uh, some of you may have seen it, maybe not, but it's a, a number that is almost a foot tall, okay? It's the number seven. And I said, so what number can you see here? He said, well, I can't see that, I'm blind. I said, well, I understand that, you know, in this case, he had macular degeneration. I said, well, I understand you have a blind spot in, your, in the middle of your vision, but can you tell me what you think you might see as far as a number? And he kind of got angry. He said, well, you don't understand, I told you I'm blind. I said, well, okay. I'm the wrong guy to say that to. So I sat down next to him and I said, so let me ask you a question. How did you get into my office? He said, well, my daughter drove me. I said, no, no, I didn't say, how did you get to my office? I said, how did you get into my office? He said, oh, well, we came in the front door and we met your receptionist and I'm shaking my head. And he goes, and we walked around the desk and came down the hall and into this room. I said, exactly. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's the same vision I want you to use to read my chart. And he kind of sat back and wasn't sure. And I said, do me a favor, just watch where I go in the room. And he followed me and I said, now I'm standing next to the chart. He said, I want you to look toward me. He goes, okay, but I don't see you well. I said, that's, that's fine. I, that's right where I want you to look. But when you're looking at me out of the corner of your vision, can you tell? He goes, yeah, there's a big number seven there. I said, perfect. Well, by the time we were done, he, ran, he read the chart actually all the way down to 2200, which you know, for sighted people, that sounds terrible. In the low vision world, that's actually really good usable vision that we can do something with. And his daughter looked at him and she said, Dad, you told me you couldn't see. And the greatest statement was, he looked at her and he said, I didn't know I could see. So in the beginning, he was focusing on what he had lost. By the time we were done, he had a completely, pardon the pun, different outlook because he now understood that he could choose to do that, look where he wouldn't see or use what he had and be able to see a lot more and enjoy his life more. So again, it is choices, 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 choices. What do we do, okay? I want to encourage all of you who may be wrestling with this right now to think about that. In what ways have you allowed maybe keratoconus to be something that you've leaned on as a reason not to try and push forward or to succeed because you can do it. There isn't anything you can't do if you don't want to do it. And believe me, I'd do anything to be behind you and be your cheerleader. So choices, 
what do you do? Well, I want to tell you a little different story, uh, and that's my own journey, okay? Uh, I told you about where I grew up. Uh, so in light of the dream that I wanted to go and help people, uh, I ended up going to Illinois Benedictine College in Lyle, Illinois, and I was blessed to be accepted early, uh, skipping my fourth year in college, and was accepted into the Illinois College of Optometry in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I went to school there for four years and uh, loved it, had a great class, great people, and I came out into practice and ended up in general practice and was very happy because I was able to help people be able to see. Uh, though I will tell you that even though I was enjoying watching people walk out of the office with their new glasses and contacts and smiling and being happy, there was still something that was missing for me. Um, but I eventually, uh, five years after graduating, was finally able to buy my own practice out in Sycamore, Illinois, which is about 60 miles west of Chicago, directly west, right next door to DeKalb, and um, enjoyed my practice. I, I was there for three years, and uh, I had evening hours because, uh, you know, you have to do that today. People work, and, you know, it's not like the old, old days where if you said you had to go to the doctor, uh, the world stopped and your boss said, go, you know, by, by all means. You know, today they say, yeah, well, you better find time on your own to go. Uh, so I saw patients late. I came home, tucked my kids in bed, and I went to eat a late dinner. And I literally sat down on the floor and leaned up against the couch. And I had a glass of iced tea and I was watching Michael Jordan and the Bulls in one of their championship runs. And I reached up to itch my head and I blocked my right eye. And when I did that, I noticed that the entire television screen was completely distorted. And I, I thought, well, maybe I have a bad tear film. And I started blinking, 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 and it wasn't clearing up. My heart kind of sank. I got up and I went over to my desk and, and Dr. Chu will laugh because this is true. Only a good optometrist would have an Amsler grid at home um, that I took out and I, I looked at it with my right eye and it looked perfectly normal. And this is just a grid with, looks like graph paper with a dot in the middle of it is what it looks like, okay? Uh, but it's it will be a, it's a very good test of your macular health, which is the direct center of your vision and how well you see. Uh, and when I covered my right eye and looked with my left eye, uh, I saw something that you never wanna see and that was that it was all distorted. Uh, and my heart just truly sank. I mean, I felt like, uh, my world was about to crash. Um, I called a, a retina specialist who was a very dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Stephen Tickey, and he had actually at one point come out to my parents' home um, about 10 years prior and had done eye exams on everybody in the family who had been diagnosed with cone rod dystrophy. So he not only was familiar with it, he was actually very familiar with my entire family's presentation of this degeneration. Um, and I called him up, he was in the same town, a, a small town. And I said, Steve, I said, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to, to do an exam on me. He said, what's going on? And I said, I told him and he goes, come over Tuesday at five o'clock. There won't be anybody here, but my assistant, myself and the cleaning crew. And I said, great. And he did his exam and he sat back on his chair and he looked at me and he said, well, I think you know what I'm gonna tell you. And that was where the other shoe finally dropped because my whole world just seemed like it crashed in on me. I didn't understand because I felt I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was helping people. I shared my faith with people. I uh, prayed with people in the exam room and um, encouraged people, counseled with people. And uh, I felt like that was all gonna just be taken away. And, and I was a little lost. Uh, and that, believe it or not, I went back to my office and uh, I really struggled with the whole idea that I had the beginning of what was going to be permanent vision loss. Uh, I am not, not ashamed to say that the next day after I was done seeing patients and I dismissed my, my uh, assistant, I closed and locked the office. I went back to my, my private office. I sat at my desk and I sobbed. I just cried and I just yelled at God, and he was very gracious. He didn't send a big bolt of lightning and fry me on the spot. Uh, he listened, but that was the point at which I felt a call to go to seminary. 
And um, I am a very persistent individual. Most of my family would use the word stubborn or friends. Uh, and I would agree, it's a combination of that. And I wanna encourage uh, those of you who are listening today, I, I wanna fan those flames in you. I want you to be the same way. Uh, I want you to say, you know, yeah, I wanna do something, okay? Uh, so I did, I ended up applying, I ended up being accepted. I went to seminary in Dubuque, Iowa, and something that never happens, I got a phone call from a church because they don't normally want to call someone who was a former student uh, immediately out of school to be the senior pastor of a church. And this was a rather large rural church in Wisconsin, over 550 members, and with all the baptized members, it was over 700. Uh, so they called and they knew of my situation. I didn't even send them my paperwork. Somebody from the denomination sent it to them. They called and long story short, they ended up calling and asking me to become their senior pastor, which I lovingly and gratefully did for nine and a quarter years. And then after that, I led another church for six months in the same town to help them while they were looking for a pastor. Then it was time to move back to Chicago and the doors opened for me to go to Spectrios Institute. Uh, there, I got to do all of the things that Dr. Chu shared with you. Uh, I established a, a new area of the accessible technology wing, especially dealing with the vision accessibility that's built into uh, smart devices like phones and tablets and computers. And uh, that is something that I've been blessed to lecture on uh, a lot, both here in the United States and uh, overseas on a, several occasions. Uh, it was, it's awesome. And when I finally started working there and I went back to school for a course, uh, I did a 100 hour course in 10 days. Now, that is not something you want to do when you're a sighted individual. Um, uh, it was just crazy to be able to get that done. It, and, you know, I just, I wanted to do it bad enough. I studied hard. And I was relearning things because I was away from the field for over 16 years. Um, but this was the goal. It was to regain my license and be able to take care of people in low vision. Because once I was at Spectrios, I realized I was in the field that I felt like I was born to be in. This was what my dream had been, was to help people who struggled with vision loss, especially now that there were all of these new things, not just traditional things like you know, uh, spectacle magnifiers. These are awesome. I use it all the time, but there's much more than that. And it's much more than handing someone a magnifier or a telescope. Uh, it's about psychosocial counseling, working with people, talking with you and I who have vision loss, know what that's like when we have somebody who really understands and can speak our language, or they've walked in the shoes that we walk in. They've walked on the sidewalk, the road, the journey that we all walk, okay? I left there, went to a place up in Northern Michigan, and most recently, three months ago, finally had the opportunity to uh, purchase this practice, uh, which is now the New Horizons Low Vision Center here in Colorado Springs. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, if any of you are ever in Colorado Springs, I invite you, please stop in and introduce yourself. Uh, but I get to work with people every day who have keratoconus, who have vision loss from retinal degenerations like macular degeneration or a stroke or uh, a scar in the cornea. Uh, they've had an optic nerve incident where it's either lost perfusion or there's been some reason that's caused damage, glaucoma, diabetes. It doesn't matter what the cause, RP, cone rod dystrophy, whatever. These are the people that I get to work with and I get to encourage people every day. And that's what I wanna do for every one of you. Uh, that's my journey. And I just want you to understand that you know what, I'm not just somebody who's talking to you today who understands this intellectually. I understand this from somebody who knows it here, okay? I live this, I don't drive. Uh, I actually did drive um, over the last year. I went back and got my license back. Again, told you I'm persistent. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, three months ago after moving here, uh, there's way more traffic than where I was living in Wisconsin uh, and I had a car accident and no one was hurt, uh, but it just made me realize it's too, way too busy for me to be driving in this area. So I don't drive, so I understand that too, okay? And, and I can talk with people about these things. Um, so please understand when I share 
thoughts and ideas with you about coping with vision loss, I get it because I, I live with it myself every day. And understand something that even when you do well, and you will, you'll move forward and you'll find ways to overcome this and have people like Dr. Chu who can fit you with contacts that can get you better vision. You know what? There will still be days and times when it will just kind of gang up on you. I have that. Uh, and I have to kick myself and say, hey, it's time to get back in the game now. You had a, you had a day where you had um, you know, a difficult day. Uh, it was a tough pill to swallow, and it is a horse pill to swallow, but you know what? Then I get back up. I'm like, okay, yep, I've had my time off. It's time to get back in the game and keep keep fighting the good fight, okay? And that's what I want to encourage all of you, uh, and if you ever have questions, uh, like Dr. Chu mentioned, I founded the E-Center for Hope and Vision uh, as a way in which I can help counsel with people. Uh, I did pastoral counseling for many years. I emphasized that in my studies in seminary. And now all of this fits together perfectly in the low vision rehabilitation arena. Uh, I feel very blessed to be able to do that. But the E Center for Hope and Vision, it's something I work with people over the internet. So it doesn't matter where you live, um, we can talk. Uh, so know that, that that avenue is always open to you. So that's kind of my journey, which kind of leads up to my whole point, And that is with vision loss, okay? Yes, those are the things that we've come up against. Um, so what can we what can we do with that? Uh, well, I told you that my father has this same degeneration. Well, my father is now 91 years old. He is completely blind, totally blind, no light perception at all. Uh, and my dad is the world's greatest optimist. And um, in fact, I taught him how to use his iPhone eight years ago. Uh, he's actually worn out too. He's on his third iPhone. And at 91, he sends more text messages than anybody on the planet uh, and has to get the last text in. Um, he is still working at 91 uh, because of through, through that phone, he is still able to quote jobs for the business that he sold. So he does that every single day. Uh, but my dad taught us something from the time that we were little, little, I'm one of three boys. And then eventually a sister came along 10 years uh, after my younger brother. But my dad taught us both by his words and by his example that, you know, you in life are always going to come up against adversity of some, way, of some type in your life. But again, like I talked about choices, he said, you are going to have to make a choice at that point, a decision. Are you going to let that obstacle in your life stop you? Or are you going to stop, look at it, evaluate it and say, okay, how can I go over this, under it, around it, or through it, but I'm not going to let this stop me. I still got to keep going and find what I'm supposed to do next. Uh, so my dad, by his own example, uh, taught us that there is no such word as quit. And I will not let my patients use that word either. I encourage people every single day. And I tell them, I'll come and I'll walk with you. I'll help you get through. And I will do that for each one of you. Um, and know that everybody who's listening tonight, I might not know you by name, but you're on my prayer list. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you not to give up. Don't use that word quit. Say that, okay, there's got to be some way. There's got to be something I can do. Okay. Uh, so, so what do you do with that? It's, so that whole process of coping there, we've talked about the idea of denial. We've talked about depression. The idea of acceptance. What do you do then? The idea is right thinking, okay? How do you break a bad habit? There's a question for you. What's the best way to break a bad habit? The best way to break a bad habit is to replace it with a good one, all right? Sometimes you have to stop and ask yourself, the road that I'm on, am I making choices that is helping to enable a downward spiral or is it helping to promote a positive upward motion and spiral? Okay, so right thinking, it, it makes a difference how you approach things every single day. I want to encourage you to always try to focus on what you have, not what you've lost. I want you to focus on the positives, not the negatives. Even when the negatives may outweigh it, you still want to stop and look at what are those things that I see that are good? What are things that might be able to help me move forward 
in my goal because that's something you have to do. You have to set goals and priorities, okay? Even in the midst of this, if what if your goal is, I wanna read the newspaper, all right, set that goal, do it, but don't stop there, find another goal. There has, in your goals, and your they have to be things that you're gonna have to reach for a little bit, okay? When I, I grew up playing sports my whole life, Nobody ever got anywhere in sports if all they ever did was reach down and pick up the ball. You have to learn to chase after it. You have to learn to throw the ball. You have to learn to hit the ball. You have to learn to do all kinds of things. But the only way you do that is through practice. You have to practice right thinking. It's got to become a part of who you are. The more that you do it, the more it will become part of your everyday life. And it will change how you look at life and how you approach things you will look at things in a far more positive way. And that's one of the things that we do in low vision rehabilitation. Every single day, I have the great blessing of working with people and hopefully transforming them and their thinking before they leave my office. People who may walk in depressed, think that there isn't everything. I love to show them all of the things that are available today, not because they should buy everything, but I want them to see the breadth of what's available because when you see that, you realize, there is way more available that would help me do things than there are things that could stop me from doing things. So I wanna encourage every single one of you to be overcomers. Don't be people who lay down and give up. Be people who say, there's gotta be a way. And if he can do it, then I certainly should be able to do it. And I just wanna encourage you in that way. And uh, you know, coping with vision loss, it's not the easiest thing but you can do this, okay? Uh, and, and you know what? Research is going on all the time. There are gonna be cures and, and we don't know when that's gonna happen, but you wanna be ready for that. And you wanna be in a positive place for that. So make sure you keep regular appointments with your doctors because that's gonna be one of the ways that you're gonna know about that. When you know about positive things that are happening, what does that do for your thinking? It keeps you positive. It keeps you looking forward. You wanna look down the road uh, toward your goal, okay? Uh, I'm also a runner. Uh, I've run several half marathons. And you know, the only way you can complete that race, you can't be thinking about the 13th mile when you just finished mile one or two. You've gotta look ahead, maybe a, a half a mile ahead or a mile ahead and just pick a spot and that's where I need to get to. And when you get to that one, you pick the next spot. It's one step at a time, one day at a time, thinking positive, creating good habits to replace bad ones and believing in yourself that you can do it and you will overcome. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share some of these thoughts, but what I'd really like now is to hear some of the questions and, and, and how can we maybe possibly address those. Uh, so I'm gonna let Dr. Chu um, open up and uh, we'll take it from there. First of all, Dr. Pusateri, thank you for that very honest and inspiring um, testimony and story that you shared with all of us. I think, you know, as an optometrist, you have a very unique perspective when treating your patients. I would think that the majority of optometrists probably don't have a rare retinal condition that has um, contributed to permanent vision loss. And you have the perspective um, as a doctor as well as a patient. So I think that makes your experience so unique and special and um, allows patients to more easily relate to you. Yes. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, your story and the challenges that you've overcome you know with your family members as well as with yourself and i love your message that you know you want to focus on what you have and not you know dwell on the negative because that isn't very productive right um now i want to comment a few things um specifically relating to keratoconus mm -hmm. on the positive side of it keratoconus affects the front of the eye and it's typically doesn't have the same visual effects as a retinal degeneration, which um, can lead to 
well, you can definitely have central blur because of corneal scarring. Um, but the good thing about keratoconus, and I think some of the positives we can focus on are that one, we have better technology today to diagnose the condition earlier to prevent it from getting to the more advanced stages, which is not always possible in some of the retinal degenerations. Mm -hmm. With um, We have genetic testing now that can screen for risk factors in family members and children of keratoconus patients. And we also have technology such as topography and tomography to diagnose keratoconus. And once the diagnosis has been made, we have FDA approved cross-linking that is aimed to now slow or halt the progression. So hopefully we don't ever get to the point where you have permanent vision loss. And even with all of that, we have improved in the specialty contact lens arena significantly in the last decade with the advent of, uh, you know, improved hybrid contacts, better RGPs and better scleral lenses. So even in advanced keratoconus, you can still have good functional vision with a well-fitting contact lens. So I think we can try to focus on those positives in managing keratoconus and make sure that you're getting the treatment to keep you at the top of your game. So having said that, I was involved with the National Keratoconus Roundtable meeting just at the Academy of Optometry last week in Boston. And one of the topics that we brought up was depression in our keratoconus patients mm. and how it is often not even discussed or um, diagnosed in our keratoconus patients. And one of the panelists mentioned, you know, it's kind of embarrassing how infrequently optometrists ask about it or address it. And I am guilty of not asking my patients, you know, if they struggle with um, depression um, on a regular basis. However, I did bring up the fact that even if I don't ask about it, I can sense it in the way our patients are speaking in their facial expressions, in, in how motivated or unmotivated they sound when talking about their eyes, their life, you know, their work, hobbies. So my question for you is, um, from a patient's perspective, if you are undergoing challenges with your vision on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe you just couldn't get your contact in, or you lost it, it broke, um, you know, different challenges. You can't get a ride somewhere because your contact isn't working that day, or you maybe have an infection that's not allowing you to wear your lens and hence you can't see. How do you recommend patients, um, uh, who do you recommend first patients reach out to, to help them? And what resources can you suggest to patients, um, I guess it would apply to keratoconus patients as well as other patients struggling with vision um, challenges, who should they reach out to? And what do you recommend they do on those days where they're just feeling down and depressed? Well, I think that's a great question. I, and I think that it, it, the answer should, needs to start with, they need to acknowledge that they're feeling down and depressed. Um, that in itself can be a difficult one because some of us can be very proud about that. Um, but you can reach out to people if you're willing to do that. You need to, there has to be a willingness there to do that uh, because you, you, you will be vulnerable because um, people might see uh, deeper inside of you than you might think you'd like them to. But in the end, I will tell you uh, from personal experience that when you do that, when you speak with someone, whether it's your doctor, who's your optometrist, and and, and I agree with Dr. Chu, uh, in general practice, oftentimes it is never discussed, really. You do pay attention, and I appreciate that Dr. Chu um, is paying attention to those details and those clues. 
uh, like her, when I was at the optometry school, the first question I always started a lecture with was to ask students, what's the most important part of an exam? And they would list all of these things and I would, I would wait and I would wait and finally someone would say the case history. And I said, yes, that's great. What's the most important part of that? They would talk, talk, talk. And finally I would say, so the most important part is shut up and listen. In other words, you need to pay attention to what your patient is saying. And it's not just always words. So I encourage the doctors to be paying attention to that. And, and, and they too, to maybe have resources of maybe you know a counselor, or honestly, I will tell you, uh, people at a low vision rehab center, you don't have to have permanent vision loss to be a patient at a low vision rehab center. Um, one of, probably 80% of what we do is psychosocial counseling. Um, I will, I obviously, uh, that's part of what I, I enjoy doing is working with people, talking with them, helping them understand. I can empathize, just like you said, Dr. Chu, it, it, it actually is. And in the beginning, I would never have used the word that this is a blessing uh, in disguise. But now, uh, because of where I've been, where God has moved me in my journey, uh, I believe it is because I am able to reach people like that. So I would encourage them, don't be afraid to talk with somebody because this is something you've got to work through. Uh, and what do you do if, if that day your contact lens breaks, you've got someplace you're supposed to go? You know what? Unless you live as far rural Wisconsin as I was living up to a few months ago, uh, today we've got Uber, we've got Lyft. There are ways to still get around and, and and not as much fun as my grabbing my keys and jumping in the car and going on my own, but you can still do it. You can still be independent. You can still go to your job and you can get things done. So uh, again, it's continuing to press forward. Yes, there's a, a pitfall, uh, but don't do the you know one step forward and three steps back. Figure out a way to to reverse that. Okay, one step back. Now I got to push forward a couple to make up for that. Um, so acknowledge it, uh, seek somebody to talk with, a counselor, your pastor, uh, your, your faith leader, whoever that might be. I think that's an extremely important thing. Obviously I have my own bias because of my faith, but I will tell you that that's been one of the main things that's gotten me through. So, you know, lean on the things that you have in your life and the people you have in your life. And uh, I think that you'll find there's probably more open doors and help that you could find than you might have given it credit for. Got it. Thank you for that answer. So we have a few questions from the audience pertaining to particularly keratoconus. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna propose some of the questions and maybe we can both kind of answer them together. I think um, that'd be great. One is, is a keratoconus checkup considered a part of a routine eye care exam? Mm. Do you want to take that? Oops, are you there? Let's see, hello? Okay, let's see, I feel like we lost Dr. Pusateri because he's frozen, but I think that we are still live. So I am gonna continue and answer this question and hopefully we can get him back again. Um, so the question is, is keratoconus uh, checkup considered a part of a routine eye care exam. And I'm going to say it should be. Oh, there you are. Are you back? Now you're muted. Are okay. you back? Okay. I'm back. We had we a power lost you for a minute, yes. but I'm going to take this question here in regards to keratoconus being a part of a routine eye care exam. My answer is it should be. Every optometrist is trained to look at the cornea and look for abnormalities, including corneal thinning, corneal scarring, looking for central striae, Fleischer's ring, which is an iron deposit around the base of the cone, as well as matching up signs and symptoms. If you're having blurry vision that cannot be corrected with glasses, 
that could be a sign that you have some distortion in your cornea that could be keratoconus. But I have to say, if keratoconus is very mild and very subtle, it can be overlooked in a routine eye care exam. So for patients, I encourage you to really tell your doctors all your signs and symptoms because it helps them put together, you know, the clinical findings with the patient's feedback to best diagnose keratoconus. Another question is, what kind of work is out there for people with keratoconus to do in society now? And I think this is a very interesting question because maybe it is um, presumed that all keratoconus patients have bad vision and therefore can't get a job, but I'm gonna comment first, this is not true at all. The majority of my patients with keratoconus are correctable to very good vision, which can be 2020, <clears throat> 2025. Um, even with significant central scarring, it could be still 2040 or 2050. At that point, you can still have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. I have patients with keratoconus who do all types of jobs um, from being, there, there are students, there are doctors, there are um, attorneys, there are people that work in restaurants, do, I mean, all kinds of jobs. I do not believe that keratoconus limits your profession at all. What, what do you think about that? Uh, can you hear me right now? Yes. Okay, so I would 3000% agree with you. Um, uh, first of all, it is a, a far more correctable condition than the majority of the, the ones that I deal with on a daily basis. And I will tell you, I've got people who are, uh, severely visually impaired. They're computer engineers. Uh, they're, um, uh, I have, I have doctors, just like you said, doctors, lawyers, uh, you name it. You know, again, are you allowing yourself to be defined by that? Are you letting that be the thing you focus on? Or are you, can you say, this is a field I would like to work in. How can I make that work? knowing that maybe my vision's not perfect, but, you know, and what accommodations could be made for me. I write letters for people. Oftentimes, I've got a person who's got a significant vision impairment. He's about to take his uh, test for his license as an engineer now. Uh, he completed his education. It took him longer because he can't read as fast as everyone else. Doesn't matter. He still completed, scored very well, and I'm confident he's gonna do great on the test. One of the accommodations, we asked that they would get him a larger monitor and extra time on his test. Okay, so uh, today, you know, short of maybe being a, you know, a NASCAR driver, an airline pilot, uh, um, a neurosurgeon, uh, there are not that many jobs anymore that people who are visually impaired cannot do. Uh, so I want to encourage you by all means, you know, go for it. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think um, what you had touched upon was getting um, maybe things to help you do the, the mm -hmm. visual task better, where, where, whether it be magnifiers, more time to read, um, better lighting, um, you know, there are accommodations that can be, may be made in almost all professions to help you. So I think mm -hmm. that's great. Um, so there's a few other questions in regards to keratoconus treatments. So here, are there other, let's see, what keratoconus treatments besides scleral lenses and cross-linking are available? Are there other lenses better than scleral lenses to treat keratoconus? Do you want to address any of those? I'm gonna let you take that because that's far more your expertise than it is mine. Got um, it, I'm happy to take those. Yes. So first I have to say that scleral lenses are not necessarily the best lens for every keratoconic patient. It really depends on your disease presentation. I have patients with mild keratoconus 
who do fantastic in glasses. That's all they need. Or potentially a soft toric contact lens. Mm. If your astigmatism is higher or more irregular that glasses or soft lenses don't work, I will often try a smaller RGP lens. So these sit directly on the cornea and don't require the fluid chamber as an escleral lens. And I have many keratoconus patients, I'm gonna say more in the mild to moderate category that love their RGPs. And I've tried to convert them to sclerals and they hated it mm -hmm. because they were used to RGPs for decades. They didn't yeah. care that scleral lenses were the new, latest, greatest thing. They they did fine with their RGPs. But scleral lenses are more helpful for patients who become RGP intolerant or who have very steep corneas where the RGP is teetering on the cone. A scleral lens is great to provide that stability so it doesn't move as much. And now with scleral lenses, we have some more advanced tools such as doing using impression technology or a tool called a profilometer to actually map the scleral shape to better design um, scleral lens contours and can correct even higher order aberrations. It has not been perfected, but um, we have doctors working actively to improve the glare and shadows and haze that a lot of keratoconus patients suffer from. Um, Cross-linking is actually the only treatment for keratoconus. Scleral lenses don't actually treat or change the condition. They only help to improve vision. Cross-linking is the only treatment that actually changes the structure of the cornea to prevent further uh, steepening and um, progression of the disease. And again, there's epi off cross-linking, epi on cross-linking, and currently um, epi off cross-linking is the only FDA approved protocol um, uh, referred to as iLink in the United States. Um, so hopefully that answered that question. Um, and let's see, another one here, what financial help besides insurance is available for keratoconus treatment. So insurance, you know, vision insurance sometimes covers contacts for keratoconus, but not all insurances do. Medical insurances, I'm gonna tell you, it's very um, inconsistent whether or not they actually correct, uh, cover contacts. Um, some do, some don't, but insurances are getting better at covering cross-linking. It was FDA approved in the United States in 2016, and since then we've had better and better insurance coverage for cross-linking. But Dr. Pusateri, do you have any advice? You know, I can understand how, you know, if you can't afford some of the treatments to see better, you're kind of stuck in a bad place. Do you have any advice for that? Well, that's when I would really encourage them to find in their area a low vision rehab facility. Um, again, like I said, you do not have to be a person who has 2400 vision to go to a facility like that. In fact, we have patients that are 2020. Uh, okay, so why would they be a low vision patient? Well, they may have lost a significant amount of peripheral vision. The thing is, we work with every day people who have vision loss and we find ways and not just, uh, like I said, with a magnifier or a telescope, those might be great tools, but there are many, many more ways and strategies and techniques that we've learned through the years that we might be able to teach you. You may have everything you need right there with you, just not knowing how to put it all together and how could that be used to further things for you. Um, so I would encourage them to absolutely find a low vision rehab facility in their area and and go for one of their evaluations to see what things might be available. I think you might be very surprised uh, when you're educated about what's there for you. That's a great point. Uh, in California here, we have um, the Braille Institute and we also have a few like um, Center for the Blind. There's a few organizations. And, you know, I visited the Braille Institute and it's such an amazing organization and they want 
people to know that you don't have to be blind and actually need to use Braille to utilize their resources. And so I think that's a great point that you bring up that even if you don't, you're not blind, because again, thankfully, most keratoconus patients do not go blind. Right. Um, you can still reach out and they may have some maybe they might have financial assistance or grants or funds that you might be able to apply for. Yeah. So I have um, another question here. I don't think I fully answered it. You know, in, in regards to treatments for keratoconus, you know, we kind of, I only touched upon cross-linking and contact lenses as a non-surgical option. There are also surgical interventions to help improve vision for keratoconus, such as corneal intacts, where they put these rings in to try to flatten the cornea. Sometimes you can gain better vision in soft contacts or glasses by flattening the cornea with corneal intacts. Um, we also have something called topography guided PRK, which is not the same as LASIK. So very important point for our keratoconus patients, don't get LASIK. It's contraindicated for keratoconus. Your cornea is already thin. You don't want to make it even thinner, which could make the condition worse. But topography guided PRK selectively removes a very small amount of corneal tissue to try to smooth it out. And that can sometimes help with vision in conjunction with um, cross-linking and corneal intacts. And the last thing, if your cornea has become so thin and so scarred that you know contacts and glasses are not an option anymore, that's when you may need to have a corneal transplant. But I wanna stress that a very small minority of keratoconus patients actually have to have a transplant. Today, our, our technology treatment options and contacts have improved so much that they're not doing transplants as often as they were, for instance, 20 years ago. So that is something positive that we can kind of focus on, that treatment is, is getting better and better for keratoconus. Um, so I think, uh, and someone had mentioned, you know, a cornea implant, Xenia, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, variations. And, um, you know, our last webinar was on what's new with corneal transplants. And there's there's always new technology coming out. The Xenia, X-E-N-I-A, I'm not that familiar with that particular form of cornea transplant. It's a variation of different kinds of transplants. But the exciting thing is that we have surgeons and doctors researching and learning out there, you know, how they can help to stabilize the tissue, prevent it from getting worse, to help you uh, uh, keep your vision forever. Yes. So I think that's something we can be encouraged uh, with. And, and like you said, Dr. Pusateri, focus on what we have and, and where we can, um, what we can utilize and looking at the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. So yeah. we have two minutes. Do you have anything else that you'd like to add to our um, group today? Uh, just that I, I Everything you just said, I, I, I wholeheartedly support everything you just said. I guess one of the things I thought of as you were talking to is, you know, uh, yes, corneal transplant is put to the very end as, a, as the last step in the process, but it is still today that's improved. It, uh -huh. You know, sometimes people think, oh, well, that's, well, no, that's advanced just like everything else has. And, and I will tell you that when I had been invited to go and speak over in both in uh, Asut, Egypt, which south of, of Cairo, and then in Khartoum, Sudan, both occasions, I took corneas with me uh, to be transplanted, uh, 20 on the first trip and 15 on the next. And I will tell you, every single one of those patients, the corneas took, and their vision was restored. Uh, wow, amazing. Is, you know, this is in an area where, you know, honestly, we're blessed. We have probably... I personally think the greatest medical care in the world in this country. And, you know, there's so much available to patients today. Uh, to, again, don't think of that as the worst scenario in the world anymore. It's, it's a great thing, but the, there's so many new things before that's even uh, on the table for discussion that I think it's a tremendous blessing for people. Uh, and again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your expertise your 
honest sharing and um, everything you've shared with uh, the National Keratoconus Foundation and our group today. That is your information. So for yep. anyone who wants to reach out to Dr. Pusateri, here it is. And I believe there's one more slide if you can get to that. Yep. Um, please join us for our next evening webinar on January 11th, 2022. My gosh, we're almost there. Our topic will be dry eye disease and it will be led by Dr. Melissa Barnett. So please join us in two months Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time this evening. And thank you to our guest speaker, Dr. Greg Puzateri. It was a pleasure meeting you. And um, thank you for everything you shared with our group this evening. Thank you again for the opportunity and God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.